Good morning, Dale. Thanks for having me. First of all, big congratulations on the Oscars win. Fantastic work there. Thank you. Um, I understand, I read somewhere that when you were first approached to make this documentary, you actually turned down the opportunity because you thought, well, what's there left to say about OJ? Uh, that's right. Yeah. I, uh, I wasn't that interested in, in rehashing a story about a murder and the trial, but I was being offered a canvas of at, the, at the time uh, around five hours, and I thought, well, that's a challenge I, I want. I want to figure out if I can make a five-hour film. And with that canvas, I realized that there's a lot more to the story that I could add that was sort of more germane to my personal interests. Yeah, and it's, you certainly go beyond, well beyond the murder, because so much of this documentary is interspersed with, you know, it explores the themes of race and power during the time of the rise of O.J. Simpson, but certainly also that led to his fall. Uh, oh, that's right. I mean, it's a story. I mean, we really sought to not only um, sort of fill in gaps about who O.J. was. Um, you know, a lot of people generationally, if you're under 30 years old, you think, oh, isn't he that football player that killed his wife? Well. He was a significant cultural figure well before we got to 1994. And I think the need to shed light on who O.J. was as a man and his cultural significance, in addition to the very real and important historical context that led into, you know, what, that made the trial what it was as far as why it was so socially significant, those were gaps that needed to be filled in. And you know what was really interesting, one thing that struck me, and I'm sure many other people might not be aware of this as well, is just how much O.J. Simpson denied his own race and distanced himself from the African community, African American community, especially in his younger years when he was emerging as a big sports star. I mean, it's, you know, it's obviously, even the way you say that, it's obviously a little bit more complicated than that. I mm. mean, I think that, you know, going back to the late 60s when he became, you know, a nationally known football star and he, you know, was a very fraught time politically. He was asked to join, you know, there's a, there's a movement of black athletes embodied by Muhammad Ali and, and mm. Jim Brown and Bill Russell and other American, you know, African-American, you know, athletic stars at the time. And he was asked to join a movement. Um, to sort of that what is going to lead into potentially boycotting the 1968 Olympic Games. And he famously told Harry Edwards, who was spearheading that movement, he told him, I'm not black, I'm OJ. And in saying that, he sort of wanted to go his own way. He didn't want to be defined by his race and have the, the burden of, of sort of going one way politically when what he wanted was essentially to do what he wanted. He wanted to be in commercials and wanted to go to Hollywood. And he didn't want to be held down by his race. I think OJ sort of was very clear that he was black, but he certainly didn't want to be held down by it. So I think it's more that OJ trafficked in a version of you know, personal exceptionalism yeah. when it came to matters of race. What's, what's incredible and I guess a little bit ironic is that eventually he was defined by his race, especially during that very public and controversial trial. Uh, I, I know that you've, you've described yourself as a biracial black man. Do you remember where you were when that trial took place? <laughs> uh, yeah, I was at my parents' house in Washington, D.C. And this, this was the reason I ask you this question is because this was a case that really divided American society, particularly in LA, along the lines of race. What was it like? What was going on through your household? I mean, do you have a recollection of, of the sense that was created during that time? I mean, just because I have biracial parents doesn't mean it's a sort of means that I lived in a household where one person thought one thing and the other person thought something else. I mean, I, I honestly didn't follow the trial. Yeah. Um, I was in college at the time, and I have a recollection of the Bronco chase and of the verdict. And you know, O.J. Simpson, there were, there were more important things going on in my house besides O.J. Well, what, what is really interesting is, you know, even though you look back at the late 90s and you, a lot of the archival footage used in this documentary really struck me about some of the things we've seen even in modern day America. You know, for example, the, the rise of the, um, the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, these are themes that are still so relevant in Australian society today, aren't they? Oh, I mean, everything about this film, I mean, you know, history in many ways is not past, it's present. And I think, you know, while I was making this film to recontextualize the trial of 94 and 95, it was, you know, it was implied that everything that we were talking about in the film was germane to what was happening in the States today and I guess over the world, you know, around the world. And so, I mean, it's a universal story. It's a story about race and celebrity and, and class and gender and the criminal justice system and the media. You know, these are all things that sort of are still fraught topics in our culture today. Ezra, I know that you've, you've previously mentioned that you, in many ways when you were making this documentary, you saw parallel between the character of O.J. Simpson and the current U.S. President Donald Trump. I mean, the documentary is called Made in America. Can you tell us how you would draw similarities between them? Are they both a product of their times, I guess? I mean, I don't know. I didn't see that when I was making the, the film. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's hard when you look at the rise of Trump since the film has, you know, um, come out. The parallels in terms of, you know, a, a media culture that creates somebody that we allow 
you know, as because they're on our TV every day. Mm -hmm. And we sort of, you know, when you think of why Donald Trump's in the White House in the first place, I think it, a lot has to do with the name recognition of a guy being in our culture for the last 30 years. And I think, you know, for a guy who has, you know, narcissistic and sociopathic tendencies, I think we're more sort of uh, seduced by the celebrity of people um, than we are by the substance. And I think that sort of certainly defined OJ's rise as well. I mean, OJ was a much more beloved figure than Donald Trump ever was in our culture. But when you look at even what happened with O.J. after the trial, a guy who was on trial for murder for nine months, you know, a year later was found culpable, um, responsible in the civil trial for the for the deaths of Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown. And then you see him out in the world and people still want to come around and sign his, you know, get his autograph and, and hug him. There's a sense that I think if you're famous in an American society, that makes you good. Yeah. Not sure, but it certainly makes you popular. Certainly does. And Ezra, I know that you're here in Australia for the Australian International Documentary Conference that's being held in Melbourne. You're an Academy Award winning uh, documentary maker now. What do you hope people will take away from this documentary? And I guess what's your advice to, to documentary filmmakers out there? Oh, I mean, just to, uh, you know, find a story and, uh, you know, work as hard as you can to have that story come to life. I mean, for me, it's all about you know, truth, truth and, and honesty in your approach. And, you know, if people could use the film that we made as a lesson as far as, a, you know, lesson in perseverance and hard work um, and trying to sort of express themselves to the documentary form, that's all, that's all I could ask. All right. Ezra Edelman, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you, Del.